uh, nine, uh, excuse me, 830. Um, I'm going to welcome everyone to our um, 17th Sam Seeds Research Day. Uh, you know, I've been here since 1988, so I've seen a number of these. Actually, I got here early uh, in 1988 and, and uh, was actually here uh, during the 1988 uh, research day and actually took my uh, boards here uh, before I started fellowship in, um, in July of 1988. And this is our, uh, uh, so uh, they had research day, it wasn't called Sam Seeds, but they did have some semblance of a research day, but this is the 17th Sam Seeds research day. Uh, and uh, uh, Sam Seeds, as many of you know, and many of you actually who are on this uh, um, program today, watching the program, uh, knew Sam Seeds. He was our, if I remember correctly, I just wrote the history, updated the history on our website. Uh, and I would always encourage people to watch the history on our website. Uh, Sam Seeds was our third uh, chair of obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, uh, he came from East Coast. I think he came from a uh, Harvard program, if I remember correctly. And he was chair from 1975 until his untimely death in, in Eden Park uh, in 1980. Uh, he was a maternal fetal medicine specialist uh, who helped to bring our uh, department and worked on um, uh, the uh, increasing and, and, and bettering the clinical skills uh, area of uh, maternal fetal medicine and had over 50 papers to his name before his death. Uh, today, uh, we've had a number of, of speakers uh, from all different divisions. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Adashi is our 17th speaker uh, since the Sam Seats Research Day uh, was started. Uh, Dr. Uh, Eli Adashi and I have known each other uh, since I was a fellow. Uh, he and I sort of came through uh, our pedigree. It, it's all almost the same. He actually uh, came uh, into reproductive medicine and reproductive endocrinology uh, through the Johns Hopkins program. Uh, with Georgiana and Howard Jones, and then also worked with uh, Sam Yin, who my mentor, Dr. Bob Rebar, uh, worked with uh, um, um, in, at UC San Diego, as well as working with uh, Aaron Shui. Uh, and then at some point became the uh, now former chair uh, at University of Utah, then uh, chair at Brown University, and the fifth dean of medicine and bio biological sciences at Brown University. He's been president of uh, Society of Reproductive Endocrinology, uh, SGI, now SRI, and uh, AGAS uh, in the past. And uh, uh, we are very lucky uh, to have him here. He is now a uh, professor of, of medical science at Brown and the fa on faculty uh, for the Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights. And uh, today, Dr. Adashi is going to give a talk on the Belmont Report at 40, the resetting of human subject research. Dr. Adashi, welcome back to the University of Cincinnati. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. It's a real pleasure to visit with you virtually, although I would have loved to be there in person. I can confirm what Dr. Thomas said, in the sense that um, I probably first met him when he was a fellow in training uh, at the University of Cincinnati when Dr. Rebar was the chair of the department. But we have stayed in touch ever since, and I've seen him grow and grow and grow. And of course, the future holds a significant promise and significant positions of leadership for him in store. I also wanted to say a few words about Sam Seeds, although I did not ultimately meet him in person. But as Dr. Thomas briefly mentioned, Dr. Seeds uh, was a native of Baltimore who earned his bachelor and medical degrees at Stanford. 
he ultimately came back east to do his residency training at Johns Hopkins. And it is from there that he moved initially to the University of Minnesota, from where he proceeded to join your department in the mid 70s. I was finishing my fellowship training um, in the late 70s. And in the process of looking for a faculty position, I wrote that to Dr. Seeds in the late 70s, as I mentioned. Um, all indications were that at some point I might visit the university and the possibility of a position will be explored. Unfortunately, as most of you know, of course, uh, by 1980, um, Dr. Seeds prematurely, very prematurely passed away, which essentially terminated my inquiries with the university, which at that time appointed an acting chair to fill Dr. Seed's place. And I ended up in Baltimore myself, um, as Dr. Thomas uh, mentioned earlier. And so while I did not really have the opportunity to uh, meet uh, Dr. Seed, I did uh, know of him, I did interact with him. And to this day, I often think about him and about how his life was cut so short at the age of 46. Our discussion today is perhaps best started with a statement about humanism, which as defined by the American Humanist Association, constitutes a secular philosophy that commits one to an ethical life of purpose. And the Belmont Report, as many of you who were touched by IRBs at one point or another in your life, is of course the underpinning of the ethics of human subject research. And what I would like to do today is to trace the history of the Belmont Report, which turned 40 uh, by now two years ago, um, in part because, as you will see, our discipline had indirectly a very significant role in its creation. We'll get to that point in due course. The Belmont Report, as we know it, uh, really introduced humanism and ethics to clinical research in the United States. But because of its success and endurance, it has been taken up essentially by every other nation on the globe at this point in one form or another. What the Belmont Report did is it shifted the emphasis in clinical research from the investigator to the research subject. And in terms of the ethos of the Belmont Report, it shifted the circumstance from what we used to refer to as investigator knows best to what we now require, which is IRB adjudication. The investigator cannot, will not, should not make those decisions on his or her own. And finally, the Belmont Report shifted the ethics of human subject research from the utilitarian variety to its deontologic counterpart, which is to say, from a view that morality is really all about outcome, 
namely that the risk is worth the insights gained, to a view where morality is really subject to an ethical code, namely the risk is not worth the insight gain. The human subject who participates in human subject research should come first. Which brings us to a famous quote uh, which reads, ethics and science need to shake hands. In a word, science without ethics is really not worthy of our complete uh, support and trust. This quote uh, is attributable to Richard Clark Cabot, who served as the chair of the Department of Social Ethics at Harvard University, and can be found in the introduction to his book, 1933 book, titled The Meaning of Right and Wrong. When you stop and think about it, titles don't get much better than that. But what Professor Cabot had in mind is that when science and ethics collide, and they do all the time, and we will discuss this, of course, today, one should call in, if you will, the bioethics brigade and let it adjudicate the conflict. Now, that is a statement that was made in the 30s, uh, and in many ways, therefore, was well ahead of its time. In a sense, what Dr. Cabot called for is to arrive at what he thought of as a moral right or a moral code that we can all abide by. Now the search for such a moral code has been underway for far longer than most of us appreciate. The Bermont Report was published in 1978 and then issued in final form in 1979, but there have been many efforts, or several efforts anyway, that preceded its establishment. As I mentioned earlier, because of its success, endurance, and utility, the Belmont Report became the norm. But it was preceded by a number of earlier efforts that in many ways paved the way for the Belmont Report. The first so-called ethics code in human subject research was the so-called Prussian Directive, which dates back to 1900. It was followed in 1931 by what is known as the Weimar Guidelines, and in 1947 by what is known as the Nuremberg Code. We will, of course, elaborate on all of those. In 1964, we were all treated to the Declaration of Helsinki, about which I'm certain most of you have, of course, heard and learned about. And then, and only then, did it actually come to the Belmont Report, which was made in the USA, but in some ways built on some of these predecessors. The Prussian Directive was really titled Instructions for the Directors of Clinics, Outpatient Clinics, and Other Medical Facilities. It was the product of the Kingdom of Prussia, which was then ruled by German Emperor and King Wilhelm II. In many ways, 
this directive was foundational and foresighted in that it introduced the principle of respect for persons, which survives to this day, and the precept of informed consent. Imagine that as a binding legal construct. And that goes back to 1900. The Prussian directive discussed, but excluded from the final product, the principle of beneficence, which deals with the risk benefit ratio and still appears today in the Belmont report principles, the principle of justice, namely the notion of vulnerable subjects, another principle that survived to be included in the Belmont report. And the precept of preclinical studies first. In other words, do not, as used to be the practice, proceed to carry out clinical studies on human subjects absent preclinical investigation, data accumulation that in toto will hopefully justify the transition to the human studies proper. Perhaps the most important missive of the Prussian directive was the following, respect for rights and morality is just as important as medical and scientific progress. A statement that is ascribed to Ludwig von Barr, a lawyer by profession who was the consultant to the Prussian minister at the time. And so as far back as 1900, as you can tell, some of the principles that today undergird human subject research were already operational in a significant way. In 1931, uh, the so-called Weimar guidelines were published under the title German Guidelines on Human Experimentation. I will hasten to add that this was the product of the pre-Nazi Weimar Republic and it surpassed the Prussian directive by adding the principle of beneficence to the document proper and by including the precept of preclinical studies first, this time officially, as opposed to debating, discussing, elaborating on the concepts. They also introduced the requirement of a detailed study protocol which to us today may seem as self-evident and perhaps um, uh, obvious, but everything at some point has to come to the fore and that happened for the first time with the Weimar guidelines. The Weimar guidelines discussed but excluded from the final product the notion of institutional review boards, which of course you're all familiar with and are so central to contemporary human subject research. It also excluded but considered the distinction between non-therapeutic and therapeutic research, a concept I will come back to a little bit later because it did continue to plague uh, human subject research in the United States well into the 60s and even the early 70s. 
that is today a no-no, but we will elaborate on that shortly. The import of the Weimar guidelines notwithstanding, the Weimar guidelines, not unlike the Prussian directive, were largely discounted by the medical establishment of the day on the grounds that, quote, abuses are rare, end quote, and that, quote, investigators know best, end quote. It is particularly the latter statement that characterized human subject research prior to the establishment of the Belmont Report, for example, in the United States. Doctors, as you know, were held in high esteem. Their word was final. And doctors themselves uh, were under the impression or under the conviction that uh, clinical research is something they ought to be in control of, as opposed to be subject to review by an IRB, for example. And we will see, of course, as we proceed, some examples of that, which, as I mentioned earlier, persisted all through the 60s and to some degree, of course, the early 70s as well. The Weimar guidelines, though, technically were in force through 1945. They were, of course, relegated before too long to bearing silent witness to the indescribable atrocities of the Nazi era between 1933 and 1945. It was an unfortunate historic coincidence that otherwise enlightened guidelines in the pre-Nazi Weimar Republic were relegated to non-existent or worse during the 12 years during which the atrocities of the Nazi regime were carried out. Which brings us to the Nuremberg Code in 1947, which in so many ways concludes the uh, atrocities of the Nazi era. And the Nuremberg Code, as you might imagine, was the product of the Nuremberg doctor's trial for crimes against humanity. These were German physicians who, during the Nazi era, broke every conceivable rule, committed every conceivable atrocity you can think of, and were on trial for crimes against humanity, not least of which, of course, the systematic extermination of six million victims uh, mostly but not exclusively of Jewish extraction. The Nuremberg Code added to earlier codes the precept of scientifically qualified personnel. The right of research subjects to withdraw from a clinical study if they so choose and the obligation of principal investigators to discontinue a study if warranted. That brings to mind today's equivalent, which is or would be the data monitoring committee, which is often attached to large clinical studies, a committee that has the authority, if it deems it appropriate, to discontinue a clinical study for one reason or another, not infrequently because of ethical concerns. Jay Katz, who was the Elizabeth Dolot Professor 
of Law, Medicine, and Psychiatry at Yale University and was a distinguished scholar of human subject research, offered that the Nuremberg Code was remarkable in that the judges in the most uncompromising language suggested that the tensions between progress in medical science and the inviolability of research subjects must be resolved in favor of respect for the person, his or her self-determination and autonomy. In other words, at the center of human subject research is the human subject and his or her wishes and his or her dignity should guide us all in the decisions we and our corresponding IRBs are making when it comes to human subject research. Which brings us to the declaration of Helsinki in 1964, which you probably know about for a variety of reasons, but among other things, produced an, another code that dealt with human subject research. The Declaration of Helsinki, as you know, is the product of the World Medical Association. And the general principles that it espoused at the time included respect for persons, which still exists in the Belmont Report, beneficence, which is very much still in the Belmont Report, and justice, which likewise remains a keystone of the Belmont Report. They also delved into the distinction between therapeutic research, that is to say, research conducted as part of medical care, albeit absent IRB adjudication, and research that is done under the auspices of a well-supervised uh, IRB. As we will come back to and witness the circumstances in the United States in the late, all the way through the late 60s and early 70s, we will realize that the residues of so-called therapeutic research, that is to say research that is decided upon and carried out by physicians who quote unquote know best as was so prevalent an attitude at the time um, is something that today of course should be condemned, abandoned and replaced by IRB adjudicated human subject research. Therapeutic research may well have given rise to past calamities such as the thalidomide affair. You may recall that physicians, especially in Europe, distributed, uh, were the, uh, physicians in Europe received samples of thalidomide from the manufacturer and tested it out on pregnant subjects, resulting in multiple cases of focomilia. United States largely, but not entirely, escaped this circumstance in that samples were distributed in the United States as well and given to a number of pregnant subjects in the United States as well. A small number of children with focomilia were born in the United States. A legal case followed. But overall, in relative terms, the United States was spared the thalidomide disaster. Uh, but it is exactly therapeutic research which was behind that. No IRB was ever involved in those decisions. Which is why the Belmont Report, to which we will, of course, get to in more detail, explicitly states, any research should undergo review for the protection of human subjects. 
As we look back at therapeutic research, the most charitable characterization one could afford the practice of therapeutic research is that it approximates what we now call compassionate use. But recall that compassionate use is not something a physician can decide upon on his or her own. There's a process involved which entails FDA input. You need to apply, certain criteria have to hold, and only under exceptional circumstances, uh, drugs that have yet to have been approved will be given out for some very special circumstances. So the similarities end there, but for a while there, as I said, all the way into the early 70s, therapeutic research dictated and carried out by physicians uh, was the norm of the day. Which brings us to the Belmont report, which as I mentioned earlier, uh, so permanent press in 1979, although it was released in 1978 um, in an earlier format. This might be an appropriate time for you to raise the question, why another code? We have just discussed a whole host of codes. What, what justifies the genesis of yet another code? And especially why a US code? Why couldn't we just rely on the Helsinki Declaration, for example, or some of its predecessors? Well, the reason for why a US code was necessary at the time was, as I mentioned earlier, the documented persistence of unethical human subject research in the United States and the absence of a binding national ethical code since earlier codes, such as the Helsinki Accord, were never widely embraced and or systematically followed. In other words, if you were an investigator in the United States in 1970, let's say, the notion of a code was nowhere to be found, even though by then, all kinds of codes have of course come to the fore as we have discussed earlier. But that never filtered in a meaningful way into the United States and therapeutic research unconstrained by an IRB was very much in evidence. The reality of this type of unethical research in the United States came probably first to our collective conscience through the work of Henry Beecher from Boston who was the chair of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. This paper, which he published in the New England Journal of Medicine, was titled Ethics and Clinical Research and subtitled Examples of Unethical or Questionably Ethical Studies. In this paper, Professor Beecher described 23 of 50 such documented studies that he was able to summon. The other studies were available but did not see press in this paper. One of those studies dates back to 1952, a study that saw press in the New England Journal of Medicine and was titled The Syndrome of Impending Hepatic Coma in Patients with Cirrhosis of the Liver Given Certain Nitrogenous Substances. In essence, this study entailed nine patients 
with advanced liver cirrhosis who were administered nitrogenous products without consent with an eye toward precipitating an impending hepatic coma. In other words, it wasn't the welfare of the patients that dictated this study, but rather the question presented by the investigators, which of course constituted what we called at the time therapeutic research, research unapproved by any ethical board. Not all that long after that, the front page of the New York Times described on January the 21st, 1964, what became to be known as the Cancer Immunity Study. That study involved the administration of cancer cells into non-cancerous patients without their consent during the experiments. Yet again, an example of therapeutic research that when viewed from the perspective of today, clearly comes across as blatantly unethical. None of us would want to be put in this position. And topping it all, of course, was the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, which also came to light on the front page of the New York Times on July the 25th, 1972, courtesy of a whistleblower who shared the details of the study with Jean Heller, the reporter who broke the story. Turns out that from 1932 to 1972, so for 40 years, the US Public Health Service, that is to say, the US government, involved 400 poor, disease-stricken black men from Macon County, Alabama, who were deliberately left untreated for 40 years in the name of studying the natural history of their disease. Once again, an unthinkable intervention in today's term, and one which ultimately motivated Congress and shook up the nation at the time, but motivated Congress to take action, which ultimately led to the Belmont Report in a sequence that I will describe in the next several slides. Time precludes us from a detailed discussion of what transpired in Congress after the news came out. But from 1972 to 1974, a variety of hearings transpired in Congress, two of which are illustrated in this slide, and multiple discussions transpired amongst the two parties with a give and take that ultimately produced the bill and the law that gave rise to the commission that gave rise to the Belmont Report. I'll get to that in a moment. Particularly noteworthy is the fact that at the time, bipartisanship was such that you could still have agreements reached between the parties in a constructive fashion. There was a lot of give and take. Uh, the pro-life for choice debate played into this as well. But in the end, the late Senator Kennedy uh, 
was able to broker a uh, deal, if you will, and a bill that was agreeable to both the Democrats and the Republicans in Congress, and which was ultimately voted on favorably and signed on by then President Nixon. This law uh, was to be known as the National Research Act of 1974, Title II of which was titled Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. What this uh, Title II was intended to achieve is spelled out below, that is to say, the establishment of a commission, a national commission for the protection of human subjects of biomedical and behavioral research. Congress, in fact, instructed the commission as to what it expects it to produce. The statement went as follows. To find the critical balance required to satisfy society's demands for the advancement of knowledge while abiding by its strictures to protect the dignity, privacy, and freedom of its individual members. This was to be a federal commission unlike any other. No previous federal commission was convened heretofore to define the ethical moorings of a public policy. In addition, no previous federal commission was obliged to conduct all of its deliberations in public. And finally, no previous federal commission was granted what was known as, quote, action forcing authority, end quote, on the Department of Human Health, on the Department of Health and Human Services. In essence, what that meant was that whatever the commission decided was going to become law. In other words, the Department of Health and Human Services would have to accept those recommendations, convert them into legal code, publish them in the Federal Register, and in so doing, make them the binding law of the land. And that's exactly how it worked out. And that's exactly why IRB is not an option. It's a legal requirement of United States law. The Federal Commission that was formed was unlike any other commission as well, because it was to be comprised of 11 commissioners. It was to convene monthly in Washington, DC, which ends up ended up being over three or four years which meant that the 11 commissioners came from all across the country to Washington every month, usually on a weekend, to deliberate and work with the staff, which was Washington-based, and did much of the legwork. And the commission was also instructed by law to elect its own chair, which is the point of the story where our discipline becomes of interest and relevance. Because the 11 commissioners chose Kenneth J. Ryan, MD, as their chair. Dr. Ryan was the Kate Macy Ladd and William Lambert Richardson Professor of Obstetrics gynecology and reproductive medicine at Harvard Medical School. He was at the time, doubtlessly the most well-known, most influential uh, 
OBGYN in the country by dint of his capabilities and skills, but also by dint of the fact that he chaired a leading OBGYN department. I suspect that some of the younger members of the audience may or may not know all that is to be known about Dr. Ryan. And so I will add a few details. Dr. Ryan was double boarded in medicine and obstetrics and gynecology. He carried out seminar work on placenta aromatization, which we rely upon to this day. The placenta has substantial aromatase activity, which for the longest of time led to a variety of placental function tests, so-called uh, the measurement of estriol in the urine of pregnant subjects, etc. As I said, he began his career as chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Case Western Reserve University. Later on, moved briefly to San Diego, where he chaired the new Department of Reproductive Medicine at UCSD, from which he was called back to Harvard to chair the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1973 to 1993. Most people of my generation and some of the generations that follow us, of course, knew Dr. Ryan either in person or by reputation, but it is the way of the world that memories fade and the younger generation may or may not be as familiar with this towering figure who, among other things, was the chair of the commission that produced the Belmont report, but by the by, several other reports uh, as well. The Belmont report, which anybody who was involved with an IRB probably was obliged to read, is a relatively short document and therefore user-friendly in that respect, was titled or subtitled Ethical Principles and Guidelines for the Protection of Human Subjects. It was the last of 11 reports produced by the commission chaired by Professor Ryan. As I said, it was 20 pages short, which made it digestible and more palatable to generations of members of IRB committees. And as I mentioned probably now more than once before, even though it's so press in 1979, it was first released on September the 30th, 1978. It would be natural for you and for anybody else to inquire as to what's in the name, why the Belmont report, the answer to which is, a rather, is, is rather prosaic. Uh, the report was named after a retreat that the commission undertook. Um, it was held by the commission in a, an estate, which was known as the Belmont estate. Um, it was in Elkridge, Maryland, so not too far from DC. Uh, and at the time, at least, was maintained by the Smithsonian Institution. In other words, it was a venue used by many for meetings, retreats, and the like. And this particular retreat, which ultimately led to the Belmont Report, transpired uh, on February the 13th through the 16th of 1976. For your edification, I'm 
sharing here a photograph of the Belmont estate, uh, which the Smithsonian owned and operated at the time for the purposes I described. Uh, it has since, to my knowledge, been, the property has since, to my knowledge, been transferred to the, to Howard County in Maryland, which is the county where the Belmont estate can be found. And I hear through the grapevine that some sort of a museum may be in the making, not just on account of the Belmont report, but on account of other important activities that transpired there, plus the historic value of the estate um, and some of the stories that it can tell. But back to the report, as any of you who participated in an IRB knows, the leading principles of the Belmont report are one, respect for persons, that is to say respect for autonomy and the requirement of an informed consent before a subject joins a research project. The principle of beneficence or as some would prefer non-maleficence, which deals with the risk benefit ratio and which takes into account the kind of population that one is dealing with and is taking into consideration particularly vulnerable population, be they children, pregnant subjects, individuals who are subject to um, psychiatric disease, et cetera. And ultimately, of course, is the question of justice, individual and social, which deals with the vulnerable populations I mentioned. And uh, those three principles combined undergird and have served us well in human subject research since the publication of the report now approximately 40 years ago. Perhaps the most noteworthy point about the Belmont report is its staying power. And you have to ask yourself why? After all, it's been a long time. Uh, it hasn't been replaced by any other report. There have been no calls to replace it with a different paradigm. And the likelihood is that the report, which as I mentioned earlier, became the law of the land was accompanied by yet another report of the commission, an IRB report. And this um, premonition or, you know, ability to foresee the future on the part of the committee is really probably what accounts for the longevity and success of the IRB concept and the Belmont principles. It's not as if the Belmont principles was reported in isolation. The commission also took it upon itself to issue a report on institutional review boards. A notion that, as I said, have, has been mentioned before, but has not been consummated or finalized in any meaningful fashion in the United States. And so the commission, by dint of putting out, on the one hand, the Belmont report with the principles, on the other hand, the IRB report, saw to the longevity of this combination and to the persistence of the principle to this day, 
with really no dissent or disagreements of any consequence. All of which we may want to recall has a great deal to do with the so-called action forcing authority that was given to the commission by the law which established it in the first place. It permitted the embedding of the recommendations of both the Belmont report and the IRB report into the code of federal regulations which constitutes what is referred to as our administrative law. It is a binding law and therefore it's not up to this or that university to make a choice as to whether or not to follow those rules. It is the law of the land and every single institution in the United States, be it academic or private, when and if it contemplates to conduct human subject research, it must subject the protocol to IRB review. The so-called common rule, which is the term used these days to describe the principles embedded in the Belmont report and the IRB report, now governs all institutional review boards and thereby makes the oversight of human subjects research in the United States uh, possible. I note for the sake of completeness that this and the entirety of this operation is overseen at the governmental level by the Office for Human Research Protections or OHRP for short. Uh, an agency that is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, OHRP in its present form was created in 2000. However, it had a temporary predecessor, if you will, which was known as the Office of protection from research risks, a term that has since been abandoned in favor of the Office of Human Research Protections. OHRP, which is headed today by a gentleman who is both a physician and a lawyer, reports to the Assistant Secretary for Health which is commonly abbreviated ASH, uh, A -S -H, which is a level below the Secretary of Health and Human Services. As we approach the end of this presentation, we may want to give some considerations to the parties we all should give thanks to and recognize in the context of this collective national effort that was finally prompted by the uh, infamous Tuskegee experience and which led to the formation of the commission and which led to the Belmont and IRB reports. And of course, first and foremost, we want to thank the crafters of the earlier codes going back all the way to 1900 and the so-called Weimar code, because those precedents um, doubtlessly informed the commission. And as you noted, some of the principles that are still operational today 
uh, have been mentioned as early as 1900 and have been deliberated upon obviously earlier as well. But it took uh, the action of Congress and four years of hard work on the part of the commission that they established to come up with a lasting product that we can call our own and that seems to be serving us well to this day. In addition, I think thanks are due to Congress, which sprung into action at the time and displayed its agility in uh, negotiating back and forth. The leading principles being, as I said, the late Senator Kennedy and Senator Buckley from New York, uh, who represented the Democratic and Republican Party respectively in these deliberations and were able to come to an agreement after a prolonged give and take process in which, for example, the Democrats agreed to the inclusion of a report on human fetal research, which was something the Republicans insisted on and was even then obviously a reflection of the pro-life pro-choice debate. Remember, this is all happening between 1972 and 1974. The latter part of this, of course, against the backdrop of Roe v. Wade, which was has become became the law of the land in 1973. So it's not as if the pro-life pro-choice debate is a new one, of course, but it dominated the debates about the Belmont uh, Commission, if you will, even at the time. And it's only through bipartisanship that was more in evidence in those days that a deal was reached, a commission was established, and the rest is, of course, history. We all owe inevitably a debt of gratitude to the commission proper, because as you can imagine, they put in a significant amount of time over four years 11 individuals who traveled every month to Washington and probably met in between when and if feasible. I'm aware of some meetings in San Francisco and in Boston, for example. Uh, and of course, the staff that supported their activities, although that staff was Washington based, but uh, still contributed immensely to the final product. And since that time, we can and should be grateful to the innumerable PIs who have made this whole concept work, who are invariably relying on uh, either an academic or um, perhaps private sector IRB to adjudicate and if possible approve their study before the study ever gets underway. And so I will conclude at this point um, and express a certain sense of satisfaction at an accomplishment that uh, I think uh, we can all be proud of. Uh, and even though the need that led to the formation of the commission and the ultimate outcome uh, was one we are hardly proud of and wish never occurred, it nevertheless served the purpose of finally moving Congress into action 
and creating a better situation here that no longer permits, hopefully, unethical human subject research. And in the context of your research day, you may wish to keep in mind the fact that at least a significant portion of this accomplishment is attributable to a person of our discipline who may no longer be, bid up, be with us, but who made a monumental contribution to this effort and without whose leadership um, this undertaken probably would not have been uh, concluded. I will stop at this point and of course be more than pleased to entertain any or, and all questions. I suspect we still have some time and I'd be more than happy to um, further deliberate this notion with you in the, in the next um, uh, 10, 20 minutes that I think we do have still at our disposal. Yes, we do have some time to ask Dr. Uh, Dashi some questions and uh, please either uh, send them in the chat and I'm monitoring the chat or you can come on live to ask any questions uh, uh, to Dr. Dashi that we have over the next uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're gonna take a break before starting the uh, research presentations with Dr. Zarni at 10 a.m. Uh, I guess the first question I would have, Dr. Uh, Adashi, is there a need to have a Belmont II uh, <laughs> session uh, in order to talk about the next uh, iteration of, uh, of uh, you know, what uh, uh, the IRBs uh, should be doing uh, at this point? What are your thoughts? I think it's an excellent question, uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, I don't sense or hear calls for uh, improving or polishing or replacing the current product, although that does not invalidate in any way the wisdom of your question. We are entering a very challenging period in terms of science and research. Um, perhaps most importantly in the reproductive arena. Um, IVF in many ways was just the beginning. As I reflected briefly with Dr. Thomas before we began, we are in the throes of considering uh, the phenomenon of stem cell derived gametes, for example, which will present challenges that of course could not have been foreseen by the Belmont Commission. We are looking at many other breakthrough technologies in the context of uh, reproduction. Um, there are early efforts to uh, resort to embryo biopsies, not only to predict implantation potentials, aneuploidy and the like, but also to actually project um, various um, health parameters uh, into the future with an eye towards maximizing the health of potential progeny. The science of predicting future disease is moving very quickly and the notion of applying it to the pre-implantation embryo is taking hold relatively quickly as well. There is significant progress, as you know, in um, embryo research, in the formation of so-called artificial embryos using stem cells in vitro. The International Society for Stem Cell Research just, just revised its 
criteria for research and extended the 14-day rule for human embryo research to 28 under certain circumstances, 28 days. In a word, much is happening in our world. The notion of ectogenesis or pregnancy outside the womb has received a significant boost through a recent set of papers in Nature. And there are other unbelievable, in a way, possibilities that are coming to the fore that could not have been envisioned by the crafters of the Belmont Report. Whether or not these challenging projects, ethically challenging projects, can be successfully met by the existing construct is really what we need to debate. But if we come to the conclusion that the current construct is insufficient to meet the new challenges of human subject research, and we are talking about pre-implantation and very early gestational human subject research, which may in fact take us back to some other reports of the Belmont Commission because they did report on human fetal research at the time. Uh, taking all of that into account by a thoughtful group, I think, is a reasonable proposition and one that I think ought to be considered. And if that particular group agrees or believes that the current system is insufficient to meet future needs, then by all means, uh, perhaps a revision uh, as opposed to a wholesale abolition uh, is called for. Um, I don't hear much out there in that respect, but not unlike Dr. Thomas, I'm very sensitive to all that's happening in human reproduction today, which is really where the front line is in ethical human subject research. I will conclude my answer by reminding us of the challenge of the so-called IVF add-ons, which are a number of ideas and tests that are being uh, tried out there by uh, clinics and investigators. Uh, at this stage, because of the state of regulation of IVF in the United States, um, are not subject to significant oversight other than hopefully local IRB review. But because many of these technologies are not for reasons that are, are worthy of discussion, are not subject to FDA regulation, um, they seem to be making it into the clinic uh, in a manner which perhaps should be more controlled than it currently is. And so for all of these reasons, uh, I couldn't agree more with the implication that some revisit of the uh, process may be in order, especially because of our special sensitivities and our unique familiarity with the current scene, but also with what's coming down the pike. And what is coming down the pike is rather novel and advanced, and obviously at the time, unthinkable. So yes, to answer your question, 
further deliberation would be more than appropriate. And if I may say so, considering your future role as president of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, I would <coughs> argue that this is not beyond the realm of the society to take something like this on and write it up and bring it to the attention of the necessary authorities uh, with an eye towards a constructive revision of what currently exists on the books. So yes, thank you for that thought and thank you for that suggestion. Dr. Uh, Kara Markham, one of our uh, great maternal fetal medicine docs asks, uh, the IRB and Belmont report are only as good as enforcement thereof. What do you think of recent studies like the one out of Hopkins evaluating colonoscopy performance by nurse practitioners with demographics that included 75% Black Americans? I appreciate the question. I am not familiar with the studies, uh, so I'm a little reluctant to comment on that, but I can take note of that and perhaps we can reconvene uh, later to visit that more in detail. Uh, the fact that nurse practitioners are involved per se does not in itself uh, ring a bell. Um, that's a longer discussion as to the role of nurse practitioners in today's medical universe. But the study proper is one I'm not familiar with. And um, perhaps we can revisit that. I will say the following, uh, only in that it could have relevance to what the question implies. When the state of California realized that it does not have uh, family planning services being offered in all its counties, the legislature came up with the idea that because physicians were not providing abortion services throughout the state, that perhaps nurse practitioners could. It was interesting in the sense that what the legislature did was to fund the University of California in San Francisco to conduct a study that would assess the ability of nurse practitioners to conduct first trimester abortions and compare their results to those accomplished by certified physicians. And so a well done study was carried out, the conclusion of which was that the nurse practitioners provided comparable service. And when that was established, the legislature made it possible for nurse practitioners to provide that service in underserved counties. This study goes to the comparability of skills between nurse practitioners and physicians, not always a popular subject, but it is out there and it is a reality at this point in California and is something to keep in mind when perhaps comparable issues come up. I uh, really like to, uh, we have one more. Um, I, that uh, one more uh, question. That the question I guess I would uh, want to ask if if a study was being performed. I'm kind of paraphrasing what was uh, sort of brought up. If a study was being performed these days that limited its um, uh, focus to one demographic of the population, uh, is that a study? Uh, that is uh, necessarily an appropriate study and 
is is the IRB uh, is uh, should we be trying to uh, make sure that we are researching uh, as much of the entire demographic of that community uh, as possible in order to make it a better study? I hear you. I think so. I think if uh, if the focus is not somehow scientifically warranted, meaning, let's say we are dealing with disease that is unique to a particular group, um, then yes, uh, by all means, we should embrace a diversity of research subjects. I still have fundamental confidence in the ability of the IRB to adjudicate and issue along these lines. I'd like to hope that, first of all, that the IRB in most institutions, hopefully, is sufficiently diverse to recognize issues along these lines, and or, if necessary, to bring in expertise from the outside that could expand its ability to make judgments on issues where it doesn't have perhaps the necessary expertise. But uh, without knowing much more about the specifics of the issue, uh, there's little question but that uh, embracing diversity is uh, and should be an overriding principle that I think most of us can come around. Um, uh, I would be interested in seeing more about the study in question. Um, uh, it seems to be raising several issues, perhaps more than one. Um, I'd like to hope that that study did go through an IRB. I'd like to hope that the treatment of that study was thorough, but of course, I don't have firsthand information or insight to assess that. Our, our last question is from our director of our IRB. We have a very superb IRB staff and they are on top of everything, I, I must admit, because you know uh, they, they do a good job in, in making sure that things are done appropriately and that uh, uh, we are uh, continuing to give uh, notice uh, when appropriate. Uh, but Dr. Link, uh, the director of our IRB asked a question uh, there is a movement to include pregnant women in more studies. The exclusion of pregnant women has been related to the principles of the Belmont report. How do you feel about expanding the inclusion of pregnant women in studies? Well, thank you for that question. And thank you, Dr. Ling, for serving in this important and uh, not infrequently challenging role. Sounds like this is one of those circumstances where the challenge is real. Um, obviously, the notion of pregnancy studies was dealt with by the commission. Uh, pregnant subjects were often mentioned as um, vulnerable subjects. And that notion, I'm sure, is still holding today. But pregnant subjects uh, are, after all, uh, individuals who carry a precious cargo. And if there's anything productive, constructive, that we can do to rectify um, and which requires a study, as long as it's not a harmful study, um, I would certainly entertain the possibility, examine all the facts very carefully, and determine whether or not the benefits dramatically uh, outweigh the risks. We understandably, and I couldn't agree with it more, want to treat pregnancy with kids' gloves because we the last thing we want to do is to hurt this uh, fragile state 
both from the point of view of the mother and of course the conceptors. But if there is a problem that we're trying to address and if we can do so safely, which is always a question of course, uh, but judgments have to be made, then I wouldn't take it off the roster or exclude it from the itinerary of the IRB <clears throat> on its face. In other words, I would deliberate the issue with the committee and give serious consideration to this possibility. In other words, as opposed to simply ruling it out on the face of it without some careful consideration. Uh, just because women are pregnant uh, does not mean that we don't have issues that we may want to deal with if potential harm is involved, which perhaps can be safely, and that's the emphasis, safely addressed. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for this great presentation and uh, thank not only our uh, IRB staff for joining us, but we also have our great uh, staff and, and partners at Christ Hospital, as well as some of our uh, friends and partners at the TriHealth Hospital system. Uh, but uh, as always, Dr. Dashi, we really appreciate your time and unfortunately, uh, we won't be able to continue with this for our research day presentations, uh, but I truly appreciate uh, you joining us today and I've always appreciate your friendship and guidance over these years. Uh, and thank you very much. And hopefully next time uh, uh, we have you, it won't be virtually, but it will be in person. That would certainly be wonderful.